like most other potato producers, eating his time. Not all of it, about a quarter. Because about one quarter of this crop he's planting won't reach an acceptable wear standard by the time it goes to market. That's the national average. A quarter of the crop. A quarter of our potato acreage. A quarter of all the time, effort and skill which have been expended. All for very little return. There are many reasons for this loss. Disease, virus diseases which attack the growing plant like mosaic and leaf roll. Diseases which occur during storage like dry rot and gangrene. Blemishing diseases like scab as well as tubers which are green or damaged mechanically. From harvester to trailer, from trailer to elevator, from elevator to store and out again. Potatoes are always being moved. A farmer can't handle each tuber individually. He has to move them in bulk and that means moving them with machines. But potatoes damage more easily than any other popular vegetable. In the urgency of lifting and getting them in and out of store, this can be too easily forgotten. And not all the ingenuity of the machinery designer can help you if the machines aren't being used properly. when the farmer grades his crop, he'll have to throw out quite a few potatoes because they're not the right size for the wear market or because they've deteriorated in storage. He can still damage them too, especially if he's using old and worn out tools like this fork. Even when he sends them off to market, he may not have seen the last of them. The lorry may have to return to the farm with the same load it took to market, rejected for greening and damage, not up to the grading standard laid down by the potato marketing board. The farmer will have to redress them. That's the problem. Where has the grower gone wrong and what can he do about it? The answer is quite a lot, especially if he keeps up to date with the latest developments. Good potatoes start with good seed. The latest development here is virus-tested stem cuttings, VTSC, pioneered by Rotham Sid Experimental Station and developed by the East Craig Station of the Scottish Department of Agriculture. To give the background, Dr. Jim Hardy of East Craig. The elimination of diseases from seed potato stalks, or if elimination is not achievable, simply a reduction in disease content is a most important aim of crop improvement work for two reasons. Firstly, because fewer crop reducing diseases means a higher yield of marketable tubers. And secondly, because fewer disease producing organisms means that healthier stocks are at less risk of reinfection. These are only two of the reasons why the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries for Scotland in 1947 in an attack on virus diseases, initiated a scheme for the production and certification of virus-tested stocks. And why again in 1967, the technique was increased to incorporate fungal and bacterial diseases with the introduction of a new method for the production of nuclear stocks from stem cuttings. The production of stem cuttings was a big breakthrough in disease control probably one of the most important which plant scientists have achieved in the past 25 years and one which foreign scientists have been quick to adopt. The stem cutting procedure starts with a healthy pot grown plant believed to be free of any virus infection. First, a cutting is sent away for laboratory confirmation of the plant's health. From the rest of the stem three or four further cuttings are taken. These will be kept until the confirmation of the health of the parent plant has been received.
then they will be planted out. The tubers which grow from them should provide the virus-free stocks for further multiplication. From then on, it's a story of steady propagation and growth. All of it, even in the greenhouses, taking place in upland areas with low populations of virus-bearing aphids. When the plants are large enough, they'll be planted out in the open. Over a number of years, the progeny will be multiplied to the size where they can be passed on to a commercial seed grower as his foundation VTSC stock. Some long-established varieties of potato can suffer greatly from virus infection. A much finer cutting has then to be taken from the tip of a sprout. Under the microscope, an almost infinitesimal slice is made from even this tiny cutting and transferred to a specially prepared nutrient solution. Slowly, a plant will form. Eventually, it will become big enough for a cutting to be made. From then on, the plant should grow like any other stem cutting. Although it may be impossible to find an entirely virus-free parent plant, the tips of all young sprouts are usually free of infection. With care, health can be retained. These tiny pot-grown tubers can be the nucleus of completely rejuvenated varieties. Here's the veteran variety, Mr. Bressy, grown conventionally and grown from stem cutting. The new vigour and health are remarkable. But is the stem cutting process necessary for the requirements of the average grower? Well, we think it is, because we have learned from long experience that the traditional methods of producing improved health in seed stocks does not give adequate control of many of our important diseases. The production of healthy stocks from nuclear material is not the complete answer to the problem of disease control. For as long as an appreciable acreage of inferior material continues to be grown, so also will healthy stocks continue to be at risk of reinfection. We are hopeful that with the use of these healthier stocks and with close attention to crop hygiene and to correct husbandry procedures, that we shall attain in time the crop improvement and the increased crop performance that we desire. But even the best seed and seed beds are no use if you aren't planting the variety of potato which is best for your land and your market. New varieties are produced by the plant breeding stations. Breeding starts with controlled cross-pollination in the greenhouse. The male and female plants are chosen and pollen transferred from one to the other. The fruits of this union are berries, festooning the mother plant like small green tomatoes. Cut them open and you'll find inside the true seeds of the potato plant. These seeds will produce the new varieties. The seeds are scattered first on a seed pan. These seeds have been taken from just one berry and each separate seed is genetically different. They grow quickly. There is only a week or so between each of these sowings. In less than a month, the seedlings are ready to be pricked out and planted in individual pots. Here at the Scottish Plant Breeding Station, over 150,000 such seedlings are planted every year. In greenhouse conditions, the individual plant also grows swiftly. But what's above the pot is less crucial than what's inside it. So the moment of truth for the breeder is when, with the horns destroyed, the pots are emptied. Many of the contents will be discarded, but the best of the little tubers will be saved and planted out in the hill farms the following spring. Every year, the twin processes of selection and multiplication go on. Every autumn, the yields of the trial clones are assessed, the size and shape of the tubers inspected. Only the best go forth. The differences which can occur between these trial plants are enormous. 
Hopefully, one of them will turn out to be a really outstanding new variety. Already, varieties like Pentham Crown and Dell and Maris Piper have established themselves with farmers all over Britain. Late autumn is often a good time of the year for the grower to receive his seed, especially if he's going to plant an early variety. It's important to be well prepared for its arrival, for once the sample bags have been opened and approved, it's wise to get the seed sorted and into containers suitable for chitting as soon as possible. Careful sorting is needed to ensure that the odd damaged or infected tuber doesn't get stored with the good seed potatoes and contaminate them. The seed needs to be stored in a fairly warm place for a while after its travels to allow the wounds of handling to heal over. Artificial light can help to strengthen the sprouts if the storage area is short of daylight and environmental control of some kind is essential. To take up the story, Robin Jarvis, director of the Terrington Experimental Husbandry Farm in Norfolk. In many circumstances, chitting is a very important part of the seed preparation process. The main advantage, of course, is that it advances the maturity of the crop, and this is particularly important when planting has been delayed through bad weather, the soil either too wet or too cold for there to be much growth, and especially on the heavier soils where planting often is delayed, it can be particularly useful. Chitting will enable harvesting to be carried out earlier, and this often eases the damage problem. There's less trouble in the rather better conditions in early autumn, and the storability of the crop is often better when harvesting has been reasonably early. Chitting needn't be an expensive business. Uh, elaborate houses are possible, certainly, but equally, very effective structures can be made from polythene with a minimum of expense on timber, uh, just a few pieces along the ridge and along the eaves, and the whole lot, of course, anchored securely down. Chitting is one aspect which will repay care and attention. Another that's perhaps even more vital is seedbed preparation. Now, seedbed preparation will normally start with ploughing in the previous autumn, and it's worth thinking uh, whether that is the time to put on phosphate and potash as well. If it doesn't go on then, well then all the fertilizer, nitrogen, potash and phosphate, will normally go on in the spring, either broadcast overall before cultivation start, or placed with the aid of the planter. The actual seedbed preparation in the spring uh, should be aimed at producing a tilth with a minimum of potato-sized clods. A cloddy seedbed will inevitably lead to difficult harvest. And in this context, it's worth thinking about wider rows. 36 inches, I think, should be standard, and maybe in a few years' time, we'll be thinking about a metre. Well, having prepared a decent seedbed, got the chitted seed and everything, planting obviously needs to be carried out with considerable care to avoid uh, knocking the sprouts off, messing up the tilth, and so on. But if that's all properly done, and if later on weed control, disease control are all adequate, then you should be well on the way to producing a useful crop. The careful application of approved chemicals to the crop now forms an essential part of potato husbandry. A herbicide can help keep weeds in check. Here it's being applied very early in the season to give the seed potatoes a really good start. The important thing about spraying is to use a ministry approved chemical, the symbol's clear enough, and to apply it at the recommended rates and frequencies. Regular spraying against blight is vital, especially if you're growing a susceptible variety, like King Edward. The right variety, good clean seed, careful husbandry, adequate fertilizer and chemicals. All four are needed if you're to get a good crop. There's a fifth need, good weather. You can't control the hours of sunshine or the amount of rainfall, but you can avoid being short of water by irrigating. Not all soils are suitable, and you need access to a water supply, but in certain parts of Britain, irrigation is a must if the grower is to get the best results. It can help scab control, too. The 
prop is now almost ready for lifting. A final spray is made. A chemical defoliant is applied to kill the horns at least a fortnight before lifting. Then comes lifting itself. The crucial time of the potato grower's year. The point when you can accurately assess the quality and quantity of your crop. And the point where you can really start to damage it. Which harvester should you use? There's no simple answer, but each and every grower can make his own choice by attending the harvesting and handling demonstrations organized periodically by the Potato Marketing Board. Here you'll see the latest harvesters in action, side by side, and decide which would work best on your crop and your land. The speed of operation, the way the machines cope with horns, stones and clods of earth, the ease and effectiveness of the share setting, the placing of protective material, the absence of long falls for the tubers. These are all things to look for. And after looking, you can always talk things over with another farmer or a manufacturer. They come from all over the world. At the demonstration, you'll also have the chance to see the latest handling equipment in action and assess again which will suit your own farm and conditions best. You can also tour the static exhibition and see examples of some of the other new machinery and equipment. The whole demonstration gives you a unique opportunity to look at equipment at work, often in difficult conditions. Back on the farm, the crop is loaded into store. Which kind of store is best? Again, there's no straightforward recommendation. A sound crop will keep perfectly well in the traditional clamp. The dicky pie provides a more modern variant. These advanced versions have part size of concrete and built-in ventilation ducts beneath. Other growers consider it worthwhile to have indoor storage, either purpose-built or adapted to fit their own requirements. At their experimental station at Sutton Bridge in Lincolnshire, the Potato Marketing Board made research into storage one of their first tasks when the station was set up in the mid-1960s. Three kinds of indoor storage were studied, bulk, Dutch bins and pallet boxes, as here. What this research has clearly established is the optimum environment needed for storing potatoes. Tim Dent, experimental officer at Sutton Bridge since its inception, outlines the main principles of successful storage. Well, assuming the crop has been grown correctly in the field, storage doesn't present any particularly difficult problems, providing six basic principles are adhered to. Firstly, one must lift at the right time and lift carefully. Secondly, we must ensure that the crop is kept dry during the harvesting process and also when it goes into store by preventing condensation forming on the crop. Thirdly, when this crop has been put into store, one must allow what we call a curing period, when we encourage the wounds that have been caused during harvesting and handling into store to heal over quickly. The fourth point, we must, after they're cured, we must store them at a reasonably low temperature, of about seven degrees centigrade, slightly higher for crisping potatoes, until probably about two or three weeks before unloading is contemplated when it's advisable to allow the temperature to rise to 10 to 15 degrees centigrade to prevent damage during the unloading process. Fifthly, we must control sprouting. There are now a number of chemicals available for this purpose which, if used correctly at the right time, can produce quite satisfactory results. 
And lastly, we have to protect the potatoes from frost damage. However, for occasional crops, losses, particularly from rotting, can occur even though the six basic principles have been adhered to. We have at Sutton Bridge been conducting experiments concerned with ways of identifying these problem crops, as we call them. And secondly, finding out how, if at all, they are to be stored. And thirdly, determining why they occur. In this project, we store about 40 different crops under a wide range of controlled environmental conditions and measure the storage losses which occur in each case. We have found that in a few cases, losses from such things as bacterial soft rotting and gangrene can be very much higher than others. And these are the sort of crops on which we are now concentrating. Any grower will know how successful his storage has been when he takes out his potatoes to grade them for market. But even now, with a good crop, is he getting the best possible return? Would he have done better to contract the sale of his crop earlier, even before planting? Would he do better to work like this grower, as a member of a group? In the last 10 years, there's been a tremendous growth in the number of cooperative grading and market groups for vegetable produce, especially potatoes. Basically, these groups are formed by a number of farmers coming together to organize their grading and marketing centrally. This line at a central grading station does as much work as three dozen or so local grading lines on farms. The station can help the farmer's labor problem. It offers its employees good working conditions and regular employment. It can help the grower's profits by selling more of the crop than he can independently, by finding other outlets for the too large, the too small, and the marginally damaged. It can provide growers with a professional marketing service and a genuine flow of information on market and consumer reaction. Dick Marshall, manager of East Riding Farm Produce in Humberside, one of the first such groups in the country, tells us more. The basic concept of East Riding Farm Produce Limited uh, originated at NFU county level at the Potatoes and Carrots Committee uh, and uh, members uh, of that committee spent an awful lot of time and did an awful lot of work carrying out a feasibility study before arranging meetings with local growers and eventually decided to form the cooperative. We commenced operations on 1st January 1962 and uh, in the first year of trading, uh, we turned over about 75,000 pounds worth of produce uh, from 26 original members. Since then, uh, we have grown fairly steadily and consistently to the present level. And in the last financial year, we turned over well over one million pounds worth. And in the current year, we fully expect to uh, approach the million and a half level. This uh, related to tonnage means approximately 40,000 tons of potatoes and about 10,000 tons of other produce now being received from 101 members as against the original 26. We commenced with one bay in our back house and we now have six and uh, in addition to this we now have our own wholly owned wholesale stands on Leeds Market and Sheffield Market. The advantages of membership, to my mind, are that the members have the best returns on the produce put through. A very important factor is the availability of our central grading facilities, which gives the member a complete range of market outlets for the whole of his crop. And it also takes away from him the work and the worry of dressing and marketing, enabling him to concentrate solely on his job, which is, of course, production. Such groups illustrate one of the key trends in the potato industry today, the increasingly closer links between the producer and his market. Undeniably, the market is getting more demanding, both of the quality of potatoes and the range of products from them. That's why grading standards are bound to become more and more stringent. 
Inspections on premises by potato marketing board officials are more frequent. All batches of potatoes now have to be identifiable so that they can be traced back to the people who graded them. And this doesn't just affect wholesalers. It affects retailers too. It's all part of an attempt to ensure that a substandard batch doesn't get through to the customers because that's the way to lose them. For years, the industry has changed slowly. Now it's changing fast. The grower who will survive and prosper is the grower who keeps up with the times and with the details of the potato's progress. Don't forget that a quarter of your crop may not reach the wear standard if you fail to pay attention to detail. There's a lot of money at stake. 